now my privilege to introduce to you this year's commencement speaker, Secretary Jay Johnson. Jay, would you please join me at the podium along with Trustee Susan DeBarco. Jay, when President Barack Obama appointed you Secretary of Homeland Security in 2013, your charge included protecting the United States of America from terrorism and addressing the country's broken immigration system. In other words, you were asked to take on some of our generation's greatest political and moral challenges while working under the microscope of a highly partisan political environment. To those of you who know you, this appointment didn't come as a surprise. You come from a family with a long history of public service. Your grandfather was an influential sociologist who served as the president of Fisk University. Your uncle, a Tuskegee Airman, was arrested for trying to integrate an officer's club. Your father was an architect who served on an urban planning commission for President Lyndon Johnson. As general counsel of the Defense Department, you skillfully spearheaded reforms to the military commission system at Guantanamo Bay and co-authored the report that paved the way for the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. You were tapped for that post after serving as general counsel of the Department of the Air Force under the Clinton administration and as a federal prosecutor in New York. To this daunting task, you have brought a great legal mind and an unshakable belief in the rule of law and the democratic process. Your former boss, Defense Secretary Robert Gates, praised you as, quote, the finest lawyer I've ever worked with in government, a straightforward, plain-speaking man of great integrity. You also bring with you remarkable powers of perseverance. I'm told that in order to get a date with the dentist who became your, your wife, you fabricated a number of maladies you did not have <laughs> and made a suspicious number of appointments that you did not need. <laughs> <laughs> Almost 250 years ago, future President John Adams was persuaded to serve as defense attorney for the British soldiers charged with murder after the Boston Massacre. The law, Adams said at the time, in all the vicissitudes of government, fluctuations of the passions, or flights of enthusiasm, will preserve a steady, undeviating course. It will not bend to the uncertain wishes, imaginations, and wanton tempers of men." End quote. Today, we are proud to honor you for the same unbending dedication to legal and moral principle under difficult <coughs> circumstances, and for your di distinguished re record of service to our country. Therefore, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I do now confer upon you Jay Johnson, the degree of Do Doctor of Humane Letters Honoris Causa, with all the rights, privileges, and honors pertaining thereto. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. J. Johnson. Thank you, Jonathan. Members of the Board of Trustees, including but not limited to my wife, Susan DeMarco, <laughs> faculty, students, and your families. Students, are you ready to graduate? <laughs> that was really wimpy. <laughs> are you ready to graduate? Come on. <laughs> now, we're going to top that. Parents, are you ready to see them graduate? become financially responsible on their own. Yeah. It is an honor to receive an honorary degree alongside two great, two great Americans, Daniel Ivickson and Staff Sergeant Studentman. It is also an honor to have been selected to give the commencement address at this place, Occidental, as some of you may know, is very much a family experience for me. Not only is my wife a member of the Board of Trustees, 
But as some of you may know, Jay Jr. has just, you know, just completed his sophomore year. When we come here, some of you have gotten used to the enhanced campus security that you see around. <laughs> um, the first time I visited here as Secretary of Homeland Security, I know I took some of the students in Stewie by surprise. <laughs> Parents, imagine what happens when an eight-car motorcade, several marked California Highway Patrol vehicles, and six motorcycles, men with badges, supplemented by campus security, shows up unannounced at a freshman dorm. <laughs> you can hear, the students know what happens. You can hear many toilets flush. <laughs> slam shut. <laughs> Finally, someone sticks his head out the hall and says, oh, now I understand Jay's dad is here. <laughs> Our daughter goes to college not far from here, one of the Claremont schools. <laughs> See, we've got some Claremont parents here <laughs> whose tuition is less. <laughs> um, <laughs> He's good. <laughs> I'm under orders from my daughter when I show up at her college campus. Dad, you got to dial it back. <laughs> Keep the California Highway Patrol and your beloved bikers two blocks away. Dial it back to the bare minimum to keep you alive. <laughs> so, the first time I showed up at Natalie's campus, I did my best. But I discovered something that every student here knows about, which I didn't know about, called Yik Yak. <laughs> Yik Yak. It's this thing where students get to chat anonymously on college campuses about what's going on, I suppose, where the party is, what class is canceled, and it's like a mile and a half radius of, of social media and chat. And as soon as I stepped on campus, that morning, Yik Yak lit up. <laughs> First entry. Hey, there are two armed Secret Service men on this campus. What up? <laughs> Reply. Obama is here. <laughs> Reply. Obama's not here. He's not even in the state today. Calm down. <laughs> Next entry. Malia is here. <laughs> no, she's too young. Calm down. My son figured out how to dial into the conversation going on and couldn't help but make fun of his dad. And he said, no, it's Vin Diesel. <laughs> Finally, somebody figured it out. And they said, no, it's the fake Obama. <laughs> he runs Homeland Security, don't you know that? His daughter goes to school here. And then somebody finally said, too bad, she won't get a date in four years now. He's good. <laughs> Today, I do not intend to make news. My goal in a commencement address is to be informative, educational, maybe entertaining, but make no news. So if there's a journalist here looking for news, you will be disappointed. Mm -hmm. I intend to talk directly to the students about your road ahead in your campus newspaper. I see you've all been offered a lot of advice about, from recent graduates about the road ahead. I'd like to offer some of the same advice. First of all, I want to congratulate you for completing study in a college that is not only devoted to academic excellence in a beautiful setting and climate, but is also committed to diversity. I am impressed that the student body at Occidental includes students from 44 states, 24 countries, is 4.4% black, 12.7% Asian, 15.6% Hispanic, 
and students who are Native American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, and many others. Your student body reflects the increasing diversity and multiracial tone of our nation. There is tremendous value in living, learning, socializing, dating, and partying in a community filled with people from different regions of our country and the world of different races, religions, skin colors, nationalities, accents, and a graduation program with eight languages. The experience will serve you well once you take a job in which you work with others very different from yourself. Success requires you time and again to reach out beyond your comfort zone. If after two or four years this institution has become your comfort zone, you start the next chapter of your life in a good place. Diversity is the essence of who we are as a nation. We are a nation of immigrants. Indeed, it has been said that with each new immigrant, America becomes more American. In preparation for this speech, I met with some of your student leaders and asked them what they wanted me to talk about. One student said to me something I have not forgotten. You have a hard job. What keeps you going? What keeps you from getting frustrated and giving up? Something along the lines of what Woody said. Can one person make a difference? Well, the student was right. I do have a hard job. I run the third largest department of our government with 225,000 people with the responsibility for counterterrorism, border security, port security, aviation security, maritime security, cyber security, the enforcement and administration of our immigration laws, the training of federal law enforcement officers, protection of national leaders, protection against chemical, biological, and nuclear threats to our homeland, the response to natural disasters. All of this in a highly partisan gridlock town where it is difficult simply to get stuff done. Despite all these responsibilities and all the problems and headaches that come with them, I am confident and optimistic <clears throat> about our mission, about the future, about this country, and about public service. And I know that much can be achieved if you are willing to try. Why do I say that? First of all, you have it within you to do more then you know as you sit here. J. Charles Johnson, Jr. just completed his sophomore year, as I said earlier. He's on the track team in high school. He ran the 200 in 24.2. He'd run the 400. He'd, he'd puke his guts out. He'd say, Dad, I cannot do any better. And I said, yes, you can. Keep trying. Work at it. You can break 24. This year at Oxy, his personal best is now 21.9. And his relay team, your relay team at Oxy, the 4x400 four was, at least for a couple of hours, ranked fifth in Division Three nationwide. You have it within you to do far more than you know. I, too, am living proof of this. I am today the Secretary of Homeland Security. But you're looking at somebody who used to be a C and D student. In high school, in my house, a C on my report card was a gift. <laughs> the only time I ever heard my mother utter a four-letter word in her entire life was when she looked at my report card. <laughs> my guidance counselor told my mother, don't think about four-year college for your son. Mm. At Morehouse College, my GPA continued along the same track, 1.8 freshman year. Then finally, I found it within me to do something that ne I never thought I should do, study. <laughs> <laughs> and the last two years of Morehouse College, I had straight A's, went to law school, and went on to become a lawyer. Our US military is filled with stories of wounded warriors, who accomplished the incomprehensible. For two years when I worked as general counsel of the Department of 
Defense, I was briefed by a 38-year-old Army major on intelligence matters. After he completed his tour in the Pentagon, someone told me that this young man had been on 16 deployments, had been in six accidents, broke his back and neck when his parachute failed to open, lost part of his leg to an RPG, was shot in the back, and was the victim of three separate IED attacks. But today, this young man competes in triathlons and runs a 50-mile race. You have it within you to do more than you know. To achieve, you also must be prepared to try and be prepared to fail if you try. 60% of achieving is simply trying. In Washington, we like to say decisions are made by those who show up at the meeting, who try to be there. In the classroom, you'll never get the right answer unless you are willing to raise your hand. In politics, you will never occupy elected office unless you are willing to offer yourself as the candidate and be prepared to fail. No one gets the job or wins the race without being willing to try first. Achievement also means making your own mistakes. And you will make your own mistakes, but you must learn from them. As a parent, the hardest I've had to accept is that my children will make mistakes. I cannot prevent them from making mistakes. They must make their own mistakes, but learn from them. You will make bad choices, bad investments, bad relationships, bad haircuts, <laughs> bad shoes. But you must learn from them. A person who does not learn from his or her own, own mistakes is a fool. Mm -hmm. In life, treat others as you would have them treat you. Treat your neighbor with the same consideration you'd want from him or her. Appeal to the best, not the worst in people. Most people will respond in kind. So send me a text message with initial caps and complete sentences. Don't talk to me on a speakerphone. <laughs> they get it. Thank you. It's my generation talking. <laughs> Clean up after your dog even if you can't resist the flower bed in my front yard. <laughs> Write a thank you note after you've been invited to dinner. A little courtesy goes a long way and will bring out the best in others. And you never know who you will need later in life for help. Next, and this is my guiding principle in public office, always do the right thing. The right thing is often the hard thing. The right thing is rarely the expedient thing. Clean up after your dog after he's enjoyed my flower bed. Even when I'm not home and I'm not looking. Leave your card in the windshield of the parked car you've dented, even if no one's looking. Be honest with people. Never lie. Never break a promise. Always keep your word. Treat your word as if it's the most valuable thing you own. Most of us are lousy at being dishonest or deceptive anyway. Eventually the truth will catch up with you. More important, do the right thing for yourself. Doing the right thing means a clear conscience. A clear conscience means far more than you can ever appreciate. Doing the right things mean, means feeling good about yourself as a person. Doing the wrong thing, deceiving people, is corrosive on your own dignity, your own spirit, and your own feeling of self-worth. Next, consider a career in public service, in public policy, service to others. Ask yourself why a National Merit finalist, Staff Sergeant Studenman, was prepared to put his life on the line for others and then sign up for three more years. Benjamin Mays, the president emeritus of my college, Morehouse, used to say, we earn a living by what we get, but we earn a life by what we give. Consider a career in public service, service to others. The thing I value most about my career is my public service. No matter what I accomplish in private life, 
As a lawyer, as a corporate lawyer, I know that the first paragraph of my obituary will be about my public service. The opportunity to serve others and make a difference is self-satisfying and simply makes you a happy person. Do these things and you will do and see great things within the arc of your own adult life, beyond your comprehension as you sit here right now. Life is amazing. The opportunities in this country are amazing. It's one of the best things I love about this country. How many of you here have seen the classic film, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? <laughs> Raise your hand. Lots of you. It stars Spencer Tracy, Katherine Hepburn, and Sidney Poitier. In the movie, a white college-age daughter meets an older black man at a university in Hawaii, falls in love with him, and brings him home to San Francisco to meet her parents for dinner. The daughter wants her parents to approve of this extraordinary situation in just a few hours before they leave to get married. The movie was made in 1967, during the Civil Rights Movement, while Martin Luther King was still alive. An interracial marriage was illegal in 17 states. I recently rewatched the movie. In the movie, there was an incredible line that caught my attention, which I had heard before, but it had new meaning to me. It's an exchange between Sidney Poitier and Spencer Tracy, where Tracy, the dad, is asking Sidney Poitier, the future son-in-law, about the prospect of raising interracial kids. Question, have you given any thought to the problem your children are going to have? Answer, yes, and we'll have children. Question, is that the way my daughter feels? Answer, she feels that every single one of our biracial children will be president of the United States. <laughs> and they'll have colorful administrations. That was in 1967. It was a fictional movie script made in jest to reflect a naive optimism about the strength and wonder of this country. But in fact, at that moment, there was already a six-year-old boy who was the child of a white woman and an older black man who had met in a university in Hawaii and got married. Wow. That biracial boy finished high school, came to Occidental, and became president of the United States. And he has a colorful administration. <laughs> I'm told that today there is alive on this planet someone who will live to be 200 years old. My father is 84 years old. He graduated college, sat where you are, 62 years ago. The year he was born, his grandfather, an emancipated slave, was still alive. My father grew up in the segregated South and traveled to college in a segregated railroad car. In the relatively short span of my father's life, he has seen the advent of the TV, the color TV, the electronic typewriter, the computer, the word processor, the telex, the fax, the internet, the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad, the space program, the defeat of Nazi Germany, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Civil Rights Act of 57, the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Fair Housing Act of 68, and a black man in the Oval Office. My mother is 82 years old. She grew up in Washington, D.C. She still recalls, with great excitement, seeing her, seeing Franklin Delano Roosevelt drive by her house with the dog, with the United States Secret Service in a chase car. My mother has now lived long enough to see her son, a C&D student, become a protectee of the United States Secret Service as well. In the space of your life, you will see and do things beyond your current comprehension. And if it's not your destiny to be the second Occidental student to be president, <laughs> simply be the best at whatever you are. As Martin Luther King, the most famous graduate of Morehouse, used to say, if you are assigned to sweep streets, then sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures, sweep streets like Beethoven composed music, sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. If you can't be the sun, 
Be a star, but be the best at whatever you are. Do all these things and you will live a good and happy life, worthy of all that has been invested in you by your school, by your family, and by God. Thank you. We are proud to have you as members of the Oxy family and honored to have you here today.